panel of the Japan update on Japan and its neighbors. How is the audio? We've had a little technical problem. We'll give you a bit more audio. Good. Uh, and to our distinguished panel from the far right, uh, Kuchoshi Tanaka, former Vice Minister, Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan, uh, now a Head of um, International Strategy of the Japan Research Institute and a Senior Fellow at the Japan Center for International Economic Exchange. Uh, Dr. Surab Gupta, who is from Samuels International in Washington uh, and uh, a leading expert on territorial issues, among other things, in East Asia. Uh, and Amy King, who is here in her own right, but she's standing in for Evelyn Go, who's ill today. But Amy is from our uh, strategic, uh, defense and strategic studies area in the Coral Hill School in uh, the College of Asian Pacific. So welcome to you all uh, for a conversation about Jap Japan and its neighbors. Uh, I, I guess if you uh, look back uh, over the last 50, 60, 70 years or so, uh, the defining characteristic of Japan's neighborhood is its economic dynamism. Uh, the openness that's developed in the post-war period uh, to economic exchange, the successful embrace of the development ambition, first the recovery in Japan and then right around the region, uh, and the powerful dynamic of economic growth and development in Asia. And of course, that's uh, both defined and changed the region over time. And if you look back in all that, uh, uh, Japan has played a crucial role as the leading edge of uh, Asia's economic development uh, over those years. Going right back to the 1960s when uh, Japan committed uh, the income doubling plan and all that, and heavy industrialization transformed Japan's role in the region, including, I might say, with Australia, uh, with uh, the procurement of strategic raw materials on a scale that we've not witnessed before in international trade. Uh, and uh, of course, that from that period forward began to have a big impact uh, on the whole structure of not only the Asian economy but on. Asian politics and Japan through the 70s and 80s of course played uh, a critical role in shaping that uh, through its commitment uh, with Australia in the 80s for example around the intensification of economic exchanges across the region uh, uh, through uh, offshoring and the development of these production networks are uh, now a big feature of the region. Japan played a critical role in uh, the work towards establishing an architecture and a framework which cemented all that uh, in international context, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Framework. Uh, and uh, uh, that asserted really some important things about the nature of the process that Japan was leading in its region, including the way in which it was embedded uh, in global institutions and the global structures after the Second World War and the support they gave to what went on in Japan and Asia in the post-war period. And of course, uh, alongside that, uh, the development of the alliance uh, structure uh, between Japan and between the United States and its other alliance partners around the region. Of course, we had the tragedy of Vietnam along the way uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and the Korean Peninsula is still festering away there. Uh, but for the rest, the story is one of growth, uh, development, uh, successful economic transformation and modernization, and uh, I guess a benign political environment ordered around the commitment and ambition of everyone, including China, come lately uh, to economic development. So what's changed? Uh, I guess a number of things have changed. Uh, one thing that's changed is that if you look back 20 years or so, Japan or the United States was the largest economic partner of pretty well every country in the region. 
Uh, now, China's the largest partner, pretty well every country in the region. China overtook Japan in 1994 as the second largest economy in real terms in the world. So the relative positions of Japan and China have changed. There have been more uncertainties about uh, China's intentions uh, and assertiveness as China has become a larger uh, economic power and political power. So uh, these things have all changed. But if I turn to the panel and ask you all in a sentence or two uh, to describe what you think now are the defining characteristics of Japan's neighborhood and Japan's dealings with this neighborhood. Hitoshi, I'll start with you. What, what, how would you describe it? Well, I may not be able to describe this in one or two sentences. Let me try. Let me try. Uh, I think if we were to look back the past 60, 70 years, maybe a little bit misleading. Because when you talk about the sort of regional, uh, international, regional structures, I think we need to get back to 160 <laughs> years or so. Because when Commodore Perry came to Japan, it was 1853. That was the opening of Japan's uh, you know, modernization. And I take the theory that Japan-China relationship changes every 40 years because it's to do with the function of scale and power. 1853, the opening for the modernization of Japan, 1853, then 40 years since then, the first Japan-China war. And 40 years since then, the true first Japan-China war in 1931. Then 40 years after that, we have normalized, we did normalize our relationship. 1972. And 40 years since then, China surpassed Japan in terms of economic scale. And when I was Director General for Asian Affairs in 2001, China was only one fourth of Japan in terms of GDP. Now, China, given the depreciation of yen, China is three times as big as Japan. But what matters more may not be today. What matters more would be 40 years after this, 2050. We discussed about the possibility of tremendous population reduction in Japan in 2050. Most probably, Japan will maintain not 100 million, but probably 97 million people, as the one of the agency, independent government agency, forecasted. So the, the question is, we may be having more difficult relationship with China as time goes by into the future. So the whole question, I think this change of power structure between the two countries, we have gone through all the ups and downs and now we may be seeing much more difficult period of time in our relationship with China. That's one of the deciding elements. The second element is very much to do with the question of nationalism. Surge of nationalism in the afternoon session we talked about all the soft power. And indeed, nationalism is the main element in China and in the case of China. It was more, it is more to do with the nationalism as a emerging big power. China today <coughs> talks about free of China, Chinese dream. And we feel very uncomfortable with this concept of Chinese dream. China may think that they should uh, get, you know, they should get back to the stage of big power in the, in the 19th century. So, Japan's nationalism is more to do with frustration out of the decline of the national power. So this is the second determining element, determining element for the relationship. The third element is to do with the United States. It appears to me that the United States will not lose their absolute power in terms of economic power and also military power, but yet their external posture is changing, very much so. 
in particular from Obama, from the, uh, Bush to Obama, and most probably into the future as well. The threshold for the United States to use its military capability has gone up. Therefore, there is a kind of awkward, awkwardness in the region that is the United States going to fulfill its promise to the region or not? So there are three determining elements. The change in the scale of national power and surge of nationalism and the question of United States external posture. Those are the three elements and we will going to see it constantly into the coming 30 year, 35 years or so. That's my observation. So the shift in relative power, nationalism, and uh, trans-Pacific political bargain, right. they're the key issues. Sir, what do you think of the key issues? I'll take a more narrow construction on this question. Um, I will look at it just purely from Japan's perspective. I'm looking from the time the Cold War ended Japan was, had become very rich, it had become very prosperous, but it had worked very hard, kept its head down and worked very hard, and they felt at that point of time, the Japanese people, that now is the time for us to begin to define our identity as to who we are and what our role will be in Asia and the world. And this was not necessarily in an autonomous context, etc., etc tied within the alliance with Japanese finding a new voice. There was something tragic in the story from my perspective because just as Japan in the early 1990s came to grapple with its past and came to grapple with its past very honestly and, 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 and face many of the difficult questions and we are talking establishment Japan, the Japanese people as a people I believe have have, have totally embraced uh, what, has hap what, what has happened in the past. It is, it is part of their system. They're apologetic about it. The way they express the apology is in a different way. I mean, in Asia, we just do it a little differently. We don't say sorry, sorry, sorry indifferently. We, we do it through our actions in different ways, and the Japanese people did it. And here we have so much promise at that point of time with uh, with, with the Morero Hosokawa government and governments thereafter coming to terms with its Asian neighbors and also trying to find an identity of who Japan was and what our role would be in the world. And here's the tragic part. The tragic part is, of course, the bubble burst out there. I mean, Japan's GDP, I think, in 1995 was more than what it is today. Um, Many of the Asian countries themselves, we're talking primarily Korea and China, Korea came out through a process of democratization. It found its voice, it also found its emotions at that point of time. In China, there was the narrative changed also, and China started growing, but it also found in history a different way to, 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 uh, to identify itself. And a lot of these factors you wish came together, interacted together, and that a platform would be set but where, where these countries could agree, disagree, but they could have very intense intercourse across not just economic areas, but across cultural, political spheres, and even find ways in which they could reduce the temperature in terms of some of their, 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 their political divisions and, and territorial and geopolitical contestation. And, the tragic part is that just has not worked the way it was. The promise that existed, say, between 1990 and 1995, and what you see today in 2015 is too much of clashes and too much of competition, com 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 competition in, in a very negative sense across in, 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 in ways which are, have made East Asia a, a, fair, a pretty dangerous place. And for me, I think that this, this tragic aspect is what I see as the great change. The promise that was there, the promise which was not realized, and we are currently living that, 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 that tragedy right now, and hoping to kind of contain it, 
minimize it and find ways in which people can still coexist and find products of productive solutions down the line. But there's, a, there's some degree of disappointment and I could sense that going forward there's more reason to be cautious and to be more anxious than to actually be, be, be hopeful that you could have that period of promise that did exist at the end of COVID. No, you should bore down into that question a bit later on of uh, what was involved in Japan's attempt to redefine its position in the world and whether the fundamental assumptions underlying that somehow uh, were not appropriate assumptions and uh, what led to tears, basically. Uh, but before we do that, Amy, uh, what your take on the region where it's, where it's at? So I might be slightly controversial here and actually say we're seeing underlying consistency rather than change. Um, obviously some things are changing, but I think the consistency I would point to really since the end of World War II, the last 70 years or so, is a region in which the economics are very powerfully interconnected, you know, strong economic relationships between Japan and its neighbours, including China, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but also a region in which the, the, the political and the security uh, relationships between Japan and key neighbours are, are problematic. Uh, and again, going back to China here in particular. Now, we tend to think of the Japan-China economic relationship as a story of the last 30 years, and of course that has, has taken off very dramatically in the last 30 years. But my own research looks at how China tried to rebuild its economic relationship with Japan after World War II, and that story is very similar to the story that we've seen since post-reform and opening China. You know, China looked to, the Communist Party looked to Japan as a source of high tech, as an important model on how to industrialize and modernize an economy, uh, on a place where they could get expertise from, from Japanese industrial advisors, uh, and as a country with whom they actively wanted to trade with. Now, for all sorts of Cold War reasons, that was very difficult, and the trade relationship remained very, very small. China's socialist economy didn't make that very easy. But the origins of the story we see today uh, exist in that post-World War II era as well. But I think, crucially, despite the economic linkages that have always drawn these two countries together, they haven't translated into changing the political and security preferences, views, identities of these two countries. Um, China always traded with Japan because, at a sense of fear of Japan, if you like, uh, a sense they needed to modernise uh, and they needed to industrialise to become strong. Now, the question I think facing us all today is, um, you know, has, has China changed? Uh, has the China-Japan relationship changed? Has uh, that, that the seven decades of economic interdependence in the region, led by Japan, um, managed to translate into better political and security relations. And I think clearly there are a number of areas where that, that hasn't been the case. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're faced with, sort of confronted with the bigger political and security challenges now because China is so much bigger, uh, because of, as I mentioned, you know, there are questions about the US role in the region, and there are all these underlying territorial and other disputes that, that Surah mentions as well. Uh, but they, they have their origins in earlier era. Just take this issue of the Japan <coughs> Japan China uh, interaction and shift in balance between the two. Hitoshi, uh, you know how how do you see uh, uh, the uh, introduction of the comprehensive security bills, uh, the collective security bills, recently as reflecting uh, that fundamental shift? <coughs> Uh, you identified as a critical part of the changed regional circumstance between the US and, uh, and Japan, here ostensibly is an area of continuity uh, rather than an area of fundamental change. But uh, is, that, is that how we should be looking at it, or is there something more in it than, than meets the eye? Yeah. I am not an enthusiastic fan of Prime Minister Abe. <laughs> but yet, the responses uh, Abe san has made so far in relation to the changing international structure in the region is more or less rational. Because, given the change, I mean, by the way, this change of power structure in the region may not be a unique problem for Japan. It may be a problem to Australia, it may be a problem, should be a problem to Southeast Asia as well. The whole question is how to cope with China is rising rapidly, but yet we are so interdependent with China. Therefore, China is not Soviet Union. We don't take containment policy. But yet, we have not 
come up to the right policy mix in relation to corporates coping with the Chinese rights. Now, Abesan has <coughs> produced three set of agenda. It's like Abenomics, three arrows. One is strengthening Japanese economic capability. I mean, we discussed about Japanese economic uh, future. It may not be so brilliant, but yet Abesan has succeeded to uh, some extent. Point number, point number two, to develop Japanese national security capability. Yet under the very basic structural constitution, the, the, the Article 9 of the Constitution, but Japan has, I mean, to me, to work for the Japanese Foreign Service for almost 40 years. Surprising. Because when I came in, he talked about various things, but yet he succeeded in establishing secret preservation law. He succeeded in uh, introducing the uh, National Security Council, and he succeeded in changing Japanese uh, arms uh, export policy, the, the arms uh, technology export policy, and now, now he succeeded in changing the interpretation of the Constitution. But yet, people talk about kind of, you know, this is more and peace situation. This is unconstitutional. I don't think so. Because what Japan is going to do is a little bit above the past interpretation of the Constitution. Japan, I mean, the whole issue is a question of the collective self-defense. But the new interpretation of corrective, corrective self-defense has got a very strict conditions. The, in case the, uh, the nation, the cross nation is being attacked, we may make a judgment if it is directly to do with Japanese security, the very basic Japanese being or not. Is there any clear, clear evidence for that? It should be minimum. Japanese action must, must be minimum. And Japan, uh, only when there is no alternative to it, we will join in other nation to fight against, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, Japanese own national security, to a little bit. But yet, I think there is going to be rather sort of important uh, implication of it. Meaning, that goes to my third point, Abe-san's third arrow, that is to do with the expansion of partnerships with right-minded nations, such as Australia, such as India, such as ASEAN, such as the European Union. We, I mean, it's amazing, all the friends, Australian friends of mine came to me, visiting me in Tokyo, saying that the Australia-Japan relationship has never been better. And it was for the past two, two to three years, Japan, has, Japan and Australia has established a very intensive security relationship as well. Into the future, there is going to be more joint exercises, but it's not for the sake of, you know, attacking someone. It's for the sake of preservance of security in the region. So, abe <coughs> has established all three agenda, like three arrows in his economics. But there is a missing element here. That is diplomacy. I mean, how could we sustain this current relationship with China, Korea? And it's absurd, in a sense. There would have to be much more sort of strenuous efforts to improve the relationship. As you say, economy may play certain part because for China, economic growth is priority number one. Without substantive economic growth, they cannot contain social problems, such as the income disparity, such as the air pollution, water pollution, and also things. Therefore, China needs certain economic growth. No question about it. China, end of the day, may pursue much sort of benign policy in order to get their domestic economy fixed. But the whole question is, we don't know. We do not want to see China pursuing 
to create the hegemony in the region. We cannot let China do that. For that, we would have to introduce various set of policies. I will be discussing about those policies later on. So we, you've raised a lot of issues that we want to come back to there, and in particular, we want to come back to this, uh, if I may describe it, the hole in the donut of Japanese strategy towards the region, which um, importantly has to do with China, but has to do with a number of other countries as well. But uh, I'd like to take, uh, get uh, Sirabs and Amy's take on, on the uh, uh, collective uh, self-defense bills and, and how they play into regional relationships. As, as you put it, and as, as we read it, uh, it's a very limited change. It's a reinterpretation of the Constitution fundamentally, but it puts very strict constraints uh, on uh, Japan's security engagement uh, with allies and partners. Uh, 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 and uh, whether that uh, is uh, how the rest of the Japanese community sees is another question, and whether or not uh, that's how the region sees it, is another question. So, so what's, what's your take on that? Uh, yes, as, as Tanaka-san said, um, it's, it is very, very restrictive in terms of in, in terms of collective self-defense, and it's a very constrained form of collective self-defense. Uh, though there are within those bills other issues also, which which also which also passed, which in terms of uh, logistic support, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where which are which do not fundamentally in any way violate the Japanese constitution. What Japan will not be doing is uh, using force to settle international disputes. Or, which is using force overseas, and it will continue to maintain uh, its exclusively defensive defense, uh, defense posture. Um, the bills are very useful in the what I would call the Treaty 6 area of, of the US-Japan area, area of responsibility. Uh, it tightens defense arrangements, it builds trust, and in areas like gray zone situations and other areas where there, where there, where there, where there was a sense that there were gaps in uh, deterrence, posture, or capability, it allows for greater coordination. And therefore, it is, forms a basis on which there will be greater rules of engagement and, and, and cooperation between, the, between these countries. Um, it, in that context, helps also relations with Australia because the areas where there in strategic affairs where the ties with Australia have really jumped, have made great improvement, are things like acquisition and cross-servicing and logistic support and, and, and those areas. Now, the, I would say the dangers arise in, in a regional context in when Japan wishes to participate or is, is, is asked to participate in missions which are beyond the theater, beyond the area six area of responsibility, which, are, which is basically uh, area, article six is, uh, you would say, Bashi Channel, Philippines, and for the up north, and the Western Pacific. Uh, but where, where in, we're talking the South China Sea, and of course, uh, the Indian Ocean, Straits of Malacca, etc., etc. There's a certain degree of vagueness in terms of what exactly Japan's specific obligations will be to its partners in those areas. I mean, Japan, it's not that there's vagueness, it's just Japan is not really obligated or committed in any significant way. And therefore, partners or countries should not be imagining, and I'm talking here Philippines, I'm talking here, here Japan, I'm talking here India, I'm talking here uh, Vietnam, that things are going to change markedly in this regard in terms of how we can be more interoperable and can have greater Japanese uh, support in whatever context, even in a, in a logistics capacity. The, the security bills are very much to tie Japan more tightly to the alliance and to the key partners of the alliance, which is Australia. Is, is this what Abe intended or is it, is it? Um, Abe, Abe would have liked it to be a little bit more expansive. I, his panel wanted it to be very expansive. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say very expansive, but the language would effectively have, would have enabled Japan to assist or do collective self-defense activities or assist 
in, Amer in American missions anywhere in the world. And his, the, the main logic underlying this was that um, if trust in the US-Japan alliance fades, then the deterrent power in the Asia-Pacific also fades. So we will do what we need to do in whichever mission, wherever, so as to build trust with the Americans and keep that relationship tight. But also that concomitantly ensures that Japan's, uh, what the, 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 the roles that Japan could have gotten sucked into way beyond uh, the Asia-Pacific area might have been very large, or it, it, of course it would depend on, on independent Japanese judgment whether to participate in those missions, but the tendency is that they would kind of, with American pressure, be forced into some of these missions out there. And uh, th this, was, this was obviously whittled down and written out primarily by Komeito, and it has, was, as, as Tanaka said, said um, those, those three criteria on, for which have to be met were essentially criteria laid out in a 1972, I think, Cabinet Legislative Bureau uh, statement of what Japan can do in terms of use of force. And that was used as the basis for this reinterpretation, and that's why it has also left Japan with a very constrained uh, capability for collective self-defense. And so it's, 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 that's how it has evolved, and that's part of, the, of, the, of, of how, how politics works, because Abe did not have, he, had, he has huge numbers in parliament in the Diet, but he doesn't have his majorities, so he has to work with Komito, and, 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 and credit to Komito, I mean, they are doing a, doing a 180 or at least a 120 degree turn on many of their, of, of, of their positions, and at the end of the day, there are things to, to complain about, but there's also much to commend also. In terms of yeah, yeah, let me uh, explain what he stated, uh, because uh, the audience may not uh, know fully about the U.S. Japan Security Treaty. He talked about uh, the Security Treaty consists an important element of Security Treaty consists of two articles. The Article 5 and Article 6. Article 5 talks about the situation where Japan is being attacked by someone else, and the United States has an obligation to defend Japan. That Article 5. Article 6 talks about Japan's obligation to provide base facilities to the United States, not just for the sake of Japanese defense, but for the sake of the preservance of international security in the Far East. And there has been a constant responses on the part of the government. What is the geographical definition? He talked about north of the Philippines, inclusive Taiwan and Korea. <laughs> the government has constantly made clear that Far East is not the geographical concept. It is, I mean, originally it was to do with the U.S. defense area, because the United States has got <coughs> the reciprocal uh, history the security treaty with the Philippines, with Taiwan, <laughs> with South Korea. But now it doesn't make much sense because Taiwan no longer <coughs> exists as an ally of the United States. So this is what 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 is about the US Japan Security Treaty. So this current change in the uh, security new security registration is not to do with the concept of Far East at all. It is the concept is basically how intensive threat Japan will suffer from certain situation. It's not necessarily what we call Far East. It can be outside Far East. But one thing is quite clear in my mind. Japan is a sovereign nation. Japan will have to make judgment that Japan will help or not help. Japan, whether or not Japan provide logistical support or not. Suppose Australia joining in force with the United States in relation to South China Sea. The Australia and the United States may ask Japan to make a logistical support. Japan is a Japanese goal. Japan has to make judgment. But at that time, you have to be very, very serious because there is a constitution there is a spirit of constitution up to nine. And there is an international committee. Australia may be criticized by the rest of the world. Australians are making this war. Clearly, Japan 
will suffer from the consequences of Japan's decision to join. So in that sense, Japan is a normal nation. Why couldn't we make independent, sovereign judgment about whether or not we shall provide logistical support or not? But even under that situation, there is a very severe limitation. It would have to be to do with Japan's own security. So please do not misunderstand the whole concept. Uh, on the other hand, this is, uh, I guess, uh, this uh, explores the vagueness that sort of talked about. And this is the vagueness that clearly worried a lot of Japanese, including some very conservative Japanese, about the whole passage of the bills. And I guess uh, that's what plays into the regional relationship, absent another diplomacy. So, Amy, uh, how do you see this playing into the relationship with uh, China? Yeah, so, I mean, I completely agree with the panelists here that Japan's security legislation responses are incremental. Uh, they still require a lot of judgment call. They're an entirely legitimate and rational response to, to changing security circumstances. Uh, and yet the response in China has been pretty vociferous, I guess, and consistently so. Um, official Chinese responses since the security legislation was first raised uh, have constantly referred to uh, Abe's attempts to change the post-war order. Um, they've pointed out um, frequently how much the Japanese domestic population is in question over these issues as a, sort of a, as a way of saying, look, you know, you should listen to your population. Um, you know, the credibility from China in that regard is not necessarily all that strong. Um, and on the day after the security bills were passed in Japan, um, Xinhua's response was that Japan was putting peace and stability in East Asia as well as the international post-war order in jeopardy. So, you know, incremental on the one hand and entirely rational, and yet this is, a, this is the kind of response from China. And I think we need to understand that however incremental and um, rational these security legislation changes um, are and how legitimate they are for any country to, to pursue, they're coming at a very particular moment in Asia's history and Asia's changing strategic order. Um, and until we can sort of get that crucial issue about how the region makes strategic space for China, if it does or not, uh, all of these sorts of issues get bound up in questions about is this an attempt to constrain China or not? Um, is this about locking in a, a US-led regional order, which it sort of certainly could be interpreted as being, um, putting all of Japan's cards potentially uh, around the US alliance uh, and like-minded friends, and now all of these phrases can be interpreted in many different ways. And so uh, for, for China, the response is, um, is an understandable one, I suppose, that uh, Japan is moving in such a way that uh, is seeking to constrain, uh, constrain China's rise. Um, and ultimately, we see uh, in, in perhaps the, the lack of diplomacy between Japan and China um, on these sorts of crucial issues, the real, the real problem that I guess we'll get to in a moment, but the lack of kind of a mutual shared vision on, on Asia's future. Um, so let me uh, sort of add one thing to this debate. Uh, China, to some extent Korea, has been criticized the establishment of the law. Uh, I mean, as I said, it's not to do with aggression, it's to do with the defense of Japan, so, uh, you know. But yet, I can understand a kind of concern you just mentioned, and you mentioned as well. It's a question of confidence in Japan. And I don't think a kind of revisionist approach to the history would help to increase confidence in the region about Japan. It's wrong. Therefore, I do think that the statement uh, Prime Minister Abe issued in August 13th, he very clearly talked about one element, which is very important to me. He stated <coughs> the, all the recognitions, historical recognitions of the past prime ministers will be unshakable into the future. You talked about promises, I'm not entirely sure about promises, but yet if you were to, 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 to have meant the a kind of historical recognition on the part of Japan, yes indeed, uh, you talked about uh, the Murayama statement and uh, the Hosokawa statement as well, Koizumi statement, 
That recognition is now being shared by the Japanese Prime Minister, Abe. So, I can't say anything more than that. <laughs> that is going to be the basis for Japan to operate in relation to the past history. So, clearly, Japan needs to, you know, be engaged in much more diplomatic efforts, but yet, if you take this security registration itself, I cannot agree to the criticism by China, and clearly China will criticize something which will, you know, contribute to the security capability on the part of Japan, on the part of Australia, on the part of the United States. If you are to make criticism on that, we will say to Chinese, what about South China Sea? We have strong concerns about your unilateral approach. But at the same time, we would have to be very, very productive in relation to our diplomacy as well. So, as I said, confidence and diplomacy will be required for Japan into the future. So, I just, uh, on that issue, and the statement in particular, I mean, what you're really saying is that that statement is a reliable expression of Japanese security psychology. What do you mean by that? Well, you interpret what I mean. See, 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 see if you get it right. Well, so, I mean, you talked about the August 4th well, statement, right? The statement, and particularly the, the element in it that you yeah. emphasize. Unshakable. Yeah, so unthinkable. Yeah. Yeah. So, Un unshakable. Uh, unshakable, yes. Yeah. Uh, is a reliable expression of. Yeah, that is the Prime Minister Abbott's statement. And that has been approved by the cabinet. That's, that's so, the uh, And if uh, he, Prime Minister were to interpret the other way, then we suffer from the consequences. Yeah. Um, I think on the other statement, it, it, it positively surprised a number of people watching that. And it, it went a lot further than many expected. And uh, the regional responses, I think, were on the whole fairly positive. I mean, there was some muted criticism, but on the whole, I think they were, were pleasantly surprised. Um, but I think, I, I like your phrase, confidence and diplomacy, it's a nice way of, of posing that. Uh, and I think that the speech showed a great deal of confidence, um, and particularly the, the latter half of the statement that spoke a lot about uh, the contributions that Japan had made uh, to the region's stability and prosperity, uh, and the contributions it would continue to make, in, including through uh, the security legislation and other forms. Um, but, and Abe, Abe, in the second half of that statement, spoke about all of the sorts of things that he wanted to see in the region, rule of law, non-use of force to settle disputes, uh, international, an open international economic order, all of these things, preservation of the status quo, um, all good things, um, and yet without the diplomacy mm. with China, mm. and we, I guess we, we have the confidence but we don't have sufficient diplomacy, and without the diplomacy uh, with China in particular, uh, no, no number of apologies in, in Canberra, in Washington, uh, in Southeast Asia can make, I guess, make yeah. up the distance. So, so it is a, a reliable basis upon which you could engage in an act of diplomacy. The question is, uh, is there a, a will and inclination to do that on both sides, I suppose, not, not only on the Japanese side? Mm. It may not be necessarily only Japan who needs to think about future vision. It is to do with the future vision of the region, not necessarily Japan's diplomacy to China. Clearly, the bilateral relationship between Japan and China, uh, you know, is uh, indeed an important element of this vision, vision. But I think Australia has got the same issue. You have changed your government from very conservative to somewhat less conservative. I don't know what will be to do out of this government, but it's a crucial issue. How to cope with rise of China? How to make sure that we will not suffer from Chinese unilateralism or Chinese pursuance of hegemony? But yet China is not Soviet Union in the Cold War period. Therefore, let us engage China. What would be the right engagement policy? We haven't discussed it. We haven't discussed with Australia, with the United States, the whole thing. I think that is going to be crucially important. 
I guess one thing that we've skirted around, I do want to throw this open, we haven't got the half of it yet, but I do want to throw this open to the audience so that we get a reflection of wider interest in this subject. But one thing we haven't talked about is, you know, the relationship between security dimension and economic interdependence in the region and uh, the political and military security interests that are being pursued through and how we bring these things together. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, often these things are discussed as if they're in parallel universes. And yet, uh, the world in which we live uh, in reality uh, means that they're crucially interdependent uh, security and uh, security and economic. And Amy, how, how do you think uh, uh, the Chinese look at that? Uh, and uh, in particular, in respect of uh, their, uh, their approach politically towards Japan. I mean, I think they're absolutely fundamentally intertwined um, in, a, in a couple of ways. I mean, on, on the one hand, uh, since Xi Jinping came to power, and even before this, but in particular since Xi Jinping came to power, economics, economic development, mutual economic benefit, all of this has been front and centre in every single speech he has made uh, about the region uh, and where he sees China going in the future. Um, and, you know, and that is, um, I guess, given practical significance in the new AIB, in One Belt, One Road, and various other economic uh, diplomacy strategies. Um, he doesn't mention it quite so openly, but clearly the, the Japan-China economic relationship is fundamental to China's ability to keep on growing, uh, highly dependent on the, kind of the high-tech um, expertise uh, from Japan. Um, and the China-Japan Korea trilateral looks like the first kind of positive development we're going to be seeing in that particular Northeast Asia um, relationship um, coming up in the next month or two. So there's some really positive elements there. The other thing I think, um, and this uh, to give a plug to our uh, recently published East Asia Forum quarterly, one of our Chinese contributors, Jia Bao Zhong, makes the important point that China has much it can learn from Japan on regional economic institution building and all the rest um, in terms of official development, development assistance and everything else. Japan has made enormous contributions to Asia in that regard. So uh, one hopes that that message is, uh, is playing into to Chinese thinking about how to run these major institutions and, and do this new form of economic diplomacy in the region. You mentioned economics and, and uh, the way in which that plays into these relationships. So. Uh, earlier, Hitoshi, and and, uh, and uh, uh, the element of that which focuses on developing uh, more uh, expanded and deeper economic relations with like-minded economies, the TPP framework, for example, uh, David, where David is talking about that this morning is an important element, potentially uh, lifting uh, GDP growth by one or two percent. I, I doubt those numbers, frankly. I think that is most unlikely. Even if it did. Uh, would it make any difference at all to the nature of the economic relationship between Japan and China and the rest of the region? And what does Japan do about that? Because uh, it seems to me that still you're left with that hole in the donut there, which is China and the rest. And that's almost entirely absent from uh, certainly official thinking, uh, if not uh, private thinking and non-official thinking about uh, Japan's strategies towards its neighbors. Uh, <coughs> I talked about <coughs> the uh, Prime Minister's efforts for uh, regaining strength uh, of Japanese economy, but the like-minded, the cooperation with like-minded nations like Australia, is not just limited to the economic country. It would have to uh, include both economic, political, and security. And clearly, the relationship with Japan and Australia is uh, kind of uh, flourishing on three dimensions. No question about it. Remember that we concluded <coughs> we had a very, a very, very you know, strong resistance from agriculture community when we talked about the economic partnership agreement in 2000. So, but yet we succeeded in it, and we all the security cooperation. I hope Australia will decide on Japanese submarines. But yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this cooperation will prolong. So, I'm not talking about just economic elements in this right minded cooperation, but 
responding to your question, I think TPP is enormously important. China joined in WTO in 2001, and 10th anniversary, 2011, Chinese newspaper wrote about, now this is a 10th anniversary of China joining in international community. Let's celebrate. And this joining into WTO has helped China to grow. No question about it. TPP. TPP. I think it is going to be a major disaster if United States Congress fails to approve it. It would be, it, it, I'm sure it is going to be a major, major disaster for US strategy. Because this is important for the region. Because this talks about uh, today, uh, I think some talked about important elements, not necessarily tariff elements, but it's all those rule, rule making, and it's essential rule we would like to abide by. And probably China, in 10 years, China cannot join today because of the existence of huge state industries. China cannot, but yet, I'm sure, China will be able to join in 10 years. And this TPP is going to be the basic standard list of rules of economy which we can pursue based upon those rules, trade and investment and other things. Therefore, TPP is very important. This is yet another crucial element for the stability. I wouldn't like to see Chinese economic system prevail in the region. No way. And I am sure China would like to join in, in it eventually. So it's very important for us to talk about our desire that China should join, Korea should join, other nations should join. Well, I think you're absolutely right about the political disaster it would be if TPP didn't get up in the United States and elsewhere for that matter. But, uh, uh, there maybe uh, I have a slightly different view about how easy it's going to be for China, China to join TPP in 10 years or even 20 years' time because of the way in which the negotiations are, the whole okay. range structured. But that's another issue. Uh, so uh, I want to turn to the audience now and invite questions and comments from the audience about uh, any aspects of these issues we've already discussed, but other issues that they may have in mind. But before I do that, I just want to give uh, sort of an opportunity to come in on uh, that last set of issues and the way in which, in particular, uh, uh, Japan's strategy, economic strategy towards the re region to complement TPP strategy might be important in resolving some of the uh, political tensions within the region. Um, I know that Japan and China have begun in some respects to compete with each other in Asia in the area of development finance. And we've, it becomes kind of high profile when somebody wins a contract and somebody loses a contract, etc., etc. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in Asia, there is so much scope for development finance. There really is not about and should not be about losers. And development finance, particularly, is hardly a zero-sum game. And so you will have situations like <coughs> Bangladesh, I believe, the Japanese won a contract on, this was, there's a lot of ODA money in going into that, the, the Chinese wanted to do it in terms of a foreign direct investment project, which is more competitive. Uh, for the Bangladeshis, it made more sense to go with, 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 the, with the Japanese offer. And then you have it in, 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 in Indonesia, where, it, where, the, where the Chinese, because they're, they're willing to give no guarantees, etc., on that project. But the, maybe just to explain this point, easiest is perhaps in India, where you have what is a Delhi-Bombay freight corridor, which is being developed with, China, with, with Japanese money, and then you have a high-speed, um, kind of high-speed corridor between Chennai and Delhi, which the Chinese are developing, or doing a feasibility study on. So there's ample space and ample scope for this. That's one. This is on the development finance side. Um, in terms of trade, trade liberalization and trade competition, uh, there is, frankly, in my belief, a, a certain degree of danger that in this whole process of 
mega regionals, we are really downgrading the the, the most 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 favored nations uh, principle uh, at the multilateral at the multilateral system within the multilateral system. Um, it might seem a small thing today, but down the line, when you have not really competing blocks, but you have this sort of competition between uh, between areas, it's it's just distortive in terms of of of, of how how trades how, how trade trade flows between countries. And there again is really not that much reason for it. For example, I know TPP is a high profile, high standards in many respects, not in some respects, but in many respects. Um, there's hope that it will create great uh, welfare gains. I think the Japanese government actually, the day it, it signed on to the negotiations, put out a paper as to what the gains were, it was actually very small. But the gains will come in terms of structural reform in certain sectors like agriculture and all, which can open up relatively, relatively, relatively important gains. But you know, we have RCEP happening on the side, which is everybody downgrades it as what the heck, what's going on out here. But for all you know, I mean, a more uh, community-style liberalization, wherein there's more buying and then there's a greater degree of desire to harmonize the regulations, etc., as well as create corridors, connectivity corridors might actually have far greater gains in that in that process. So these are this is again not a zero-sum uh, contest, and let different versions play themselves out. Just like in India, let the, let the Japanese uh, do a high-speed rail corridor, and let the French do another one, and let the, let the Chinese do another one, and let's see how the whole process works out. And I think it's. It's, it's, these are all positive sum games, and I don't think we need to bring this into the, in, 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 where, in the area of, of geopolitics where there is, it is a relative sum game, and those games, game, that game is becoming more starker with rise and relative declines, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yes, in past six negotiations, presumably, are an act of potential. Don't agree him more. Yeah. We need our set instantly. We need trilaterals between Japan, China, Korea. and Korea, with trade agreements. And we need very sort of solid <coughs> cooperation on energy and also environment. You are very right in saying that. We have win-win situation by increasing interdependent relationship. And for that matter, uh, I do think that Japan should join in AIIP. Japan should work from inside uh, the transparency of the, the bank. Well, who would like to put the first question to that panel? Very shy. Oh. Right. Um, this has been a very um, good discussion, I think, and uh, I'd just like to say that um, in terms of China, which has been brought into the discussion here and there, and Amy listed there, response to Abe's statement, um, that was the very least the Chinese had to do. I mean, that was in the circumstances they had to respond that way. The problem is that um, we're dealing with a country that for 150 years was um, the poor man of Asia. It was under the subjugation effectively of colonial powers of one sort or another until the revolution in 49, and then it imposed its own um, uh, autarky and uh, uh, lost another 25 years before the opening up after the Cultural Revolution. So we're dealing with a country that has felt uh, very aggrieved that it's uh, behind Japan, behind the United States, behind the developed world and it uh, now feels that uh, having risen so quickly economically that it um, should be given the respect that comes from that. And that's what it's that's why it behaves the way it does. It really believes that it's arrived back again to its position that's on the threshold, if not already, the dominant power in East Asia. And that uh, it's it's it gets upset uh, that uh, countries don't grant it that that uh, status. Um, and uh, so I, without in any sense apologising for China, that's why I think they behave that way. And um, that's also why they appear to be so uncompromising um, uh, about uh, 
statements that uh, are meant to be reaching out a little bit, like the other station boards, for example. Um, it, as far as uh, China's concerned, however, they, the fact that they're feeling their oats and they feel that they can, should be pushing the envelope in terms of uh, achieving their aim of being a powerful country in the region, that is when it comes up against the inevitable uh, existing order that, that feels uh, that it has a right to have a position in the region, namely Japan and, and others, and uh, that's why we have this, this conflict on all the time. Um, and so uh, I think I completely agree with uh, Hitoshi that what we need is a lot more diplomacy uh, coming from um, uh, both Japan and from China, and we've seen a little bit of an improvement over the last two or three years uh, since the complete standoff after the uh, fracas over the um, Spratly Giaoyu Islands. Um, but there's a lot more needed. Perhaps now that Abe has got through this agenda, this uh, collective security agenda, um, he may uh, feel that it's he's achieved that and can uh, go to China a little bit more uh, less uh, assertively or nationalistically and perhaps Xi Jinping, that famous photo on the front page of your East Asia Forum, which was a staged photo and it was a photo that Xi Jinping had to show he wasn't smiling because he had a domestic audience back home and how Abe didn't really want to look very happy about it either. It was one of the, one of the, the best photographs of, uh, ever in, in uh, a statement of uh, what the world's really about. <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn that comment into a question. That's <laughs> and, and ask Hitoshi, uh, you know, is the space, diplomatic space now for Abe uh, to take more initiative towards China? Will we see that happen over the next few months or so? Well, it appears to me that uh, the initial stage of the encounters by you know, Prime Minister and President is going to be bilateral for China, Korea, and Japan. And I think we need to gradually build up, build up all those cooperative efforts. And uh, clearly, you talked about the importance of economic developments for China. Economic growth is going to be a crucial. I am not entirely sure if China can achieve what they call new normal, which is probably around 6% of even growth. It would be extremely difficult, I guess, for China to maintain even 6%. And for that, Chinese probably need much more sort of stronger sort of uh, investment into their locals. So Japan can play a very important role. And I do think there is a need for Japan to come up with not just bilaterals, but yet regional initiatives. Japan needs to establish something for the sake of military confidence building, because it is so dangerous for us to see accidental, possible accidental collision in the air, or in, in around Senkaku and those of things. There is a strong need for Japan, China, <laughs> United States and Korea, four of those nations create what we call military confidence building mechanism. And we need also the very strong cooperative scheme for energy. Without energy cooperation in the region, how could we achieve in 2050 East Asia is producing <coughs> the world GDP without economic solid economic energy cooperation, we cannot achieve that. So we should start a very sort of, you know, strong the, the both energy and environmental cooperation mechanism. That cannot be done bilaterally. That would have to be done probably on the East Asia Summit basis, yeah. which includes both the United States and Russia. So Japan and Australia yeah, has... Right. You mentioned yeah, Korea, Japan, China before the RCEP process, but I mean, the problem with the East Asia summit process, as distinct from the Asian Plus 6 process, is that there's no economics. 
basically the economic strategy. They have energy. Yeah. They have energy. And and uh, I mean, you're absolutely right that uh, you know Japan's capacities plays into this, including the climate change thing in China, incredibly positively. So we think there are lots of opportunities. Do you want to say something on this? Yeah, just I mean, I, I completely agree with with the points you've raised, and I think um, happily there was a slightly bigger smile on Xi Jinping's face when they met in Jakarta at the side of the Hudson Bundu meeting. Um, and you know, obviously, there's a whole domestic political context to this relationship, but this is a Japan update, so we shouldn't focus too much on that. Um, but I think, you know, since probably October, November of 2014, we've seen some positive signs, you know, particularly back-channel diplomacy, uh, Yachi Shotaro has been very, you know, active in traveling between the two uh, capitals. Um, Lika Chang has made a few um, positive initiatives, with, with, you know, seen a resumption again in the business-to-business -business delegations traveling, um, met some military uh, delegations, some sort of tentative steps in the direction of a maritime crisis mechanism, although I think we shouldn't hold our breaths yet on that one. So that's all good because order is created through these kinds of conversations and through these sort of debates and discussions about those, those points of tension. Um, but for better or worse, we're still at a point where the two sides, Japan and China, have fundamentally different views about the post-war order in Asia. Um, and that was beautifully demonstrated in the, the World War II um, anniversary commemorations last month. Um, and, and, and China is clinging very much to an order which sees Japan as playing this abnormal role in the region. And until China can work out a vision of, of the region's uh, future strategic order in which Japan feels secure, and in, until Japan can work out one that, uh, that meets kind of China's um, to some extent, not entirely, but at least acknowledges and, and meets those to some extent. I think we're, we're a long way off. And um, Peter's right, it's not just a conversation between Japan and China, but at the moment that's the big gap in all of this. That's the conversation that's not really happening. Well, maybe it will never be resolved entirely between Japan and China. I mean, I mean maybe that's the answer. I mean, Japan and China have never, well, they've had a, a, a minor and now a totally irrelevant economic agreement, financial agreement. Uh, but all of that that occurs between Japan and China on the economic front is done within global structures. It's not done within a bilateral structure. But let me take some more questions. And, uh, yep, there we go. Tessa up the back and then... Uh, um, thanks very much. Um, I, was, I was tempted to sort of raise a question about the um, um, statement on previous Japanese government statements remaining unshakable into the future because I still don't understand what that means and I think most people don't understand what that means. But I'm going to ask a different question actually, um, which is um, we haven't heard anything about North Korea in this discussion and it seems to me that it's sort of an elephant in the room. Um, obviously it's really difficult to predict what may happen in North Korea but it remains a place where all sorts of things could happen that could shake up the region in really alarming ways. Um, and I wanted to turn that around and, and ask it in a more positive way and say, I mean, is the scope for uh, more positive cooperation and collaboration and dialogue between the other countries of the region about you know, how they would react to different sorts of scenarios that might play out in North Korea? This is yours, <laughs> What is going to happen to North Korea? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> but yet, uh, there are a couple of things which we need to be sort of prepared. <coughs> Clearly, one is a creation of contingency plan, in particular on the part of US, Korea, South Korea, and Japan. Because in case uh, North Korea is going to collapse, there is going to be huge outflow of refugees. The question of who is going to uh, sort of control the nuclear weapon, and all the nightmarish questions. There is a very strong need for at least other starter, United States, Korea, and Japan, to prepare for contingency plan. China needs to be included into the future. I'm not entirely sure if China still continue, I mean, still consider North Korea as their buffer. But as China rises, China will have to take care of the international repetitions as well. 
China has got a much better relationship with South Korea. So what type of future visions China has? I think it's worthwhile for us uh, to talk to. Therefore, there is a need, even in the absence of the participation of North Korea, there is a need for us to think about informal five-party or four-party perhaps. Russia may not join, but yet I think it's uh, made sense for us to have informal discussion with China, United States, South Korea, Japan, in relation to the scenarios you talked about. There are a variety of scenarios, uh, you know, the collapse or uh, the lose of control or military provocation, yet another uh, nuclear testing and all sorts of things. Yes, you are right in saying that there is a, probably we can create common state in relation to the question of North Korea. So uh, I think uh, that is what I feel. There's a question up the back here. Uh, my name is Osan Mizawa, uh, coming from Japanese Embassy. Uh, and, uh, my question is really personal. And, uh, I'd like to hear about the opinion on the democratization of China. Uh, China the Chinese authorities uh, put priority uh, on the economic development. And to achieve the economic development, uh, political stability is necessary. So uh, we need the very strong uh, central government. So this is a rationale against the democratization in China. But I think that uh, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a high time uh, for the uh, like-minded countries, uh, for Japan, uh, Australia, United States, to speak about a little bit, little bit about uh, democratization of China in the future. Is it, is it worth less effort, or we should do that? Well, we, we should do that. This is my question. That's an interesting question that everybody will have perhaps a different cut on. But, uh, I mean, it's interesting to me, particularly because uh, historically, when you think of Tiananmen and all the rest of it, Japan's historically played a terribly important role in moderating international thinking on the transition of political systems in Asia, including in Korea, at a critical time in the change in Korea and in, in China early on. But what, what is thinking shifting dramatically in that respect? Is there no residue of that left in Japan's diplomacy towards the region? Hitoshi? Hmm. Well, uh, a few years back, a good friend of mine, Chinese friend of mine, asked me, is it a good diplomacy, I mean, democracy Japan is uh, pursuing? Japan is producing prime minister every year. Is it a uh, <laughs> uh, 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 democratic process? And he said that the United States uh, has made lots of mistakes, shooting from, you know, the air to the civilians and uh, the tortures, and also, is it a good de democracy? says. So I don't <coughs> claim that the United States and Japan and Australia maintain what we call good uh, democratic regime. But yet one thing is very important for all of us, that is the question of human rights, question of universal values, such as rule of law, such as the transparency, and also things. We should start talking about those sort of Values, not democracy or not. It's not easy for China to introduce the uh, democracy under plural political party principles. So it's up to Chinese. I don't consider that China will come to establishment of such a type of democracy. But yet, what is important for us is the basic human rights. Thank you. You have a view on this, sir? Not a very strong view, frankly. <laughs> it's 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 for ultimately the Chinese people to 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 to, to see greater social space, greater political space, and thereafter find at their time of cho it's not it's not of choosing. They don't get to choose this, but when they feel that they have the momentum that they can move to a different sort of a political system. It's for them to let them choose. It's helpful, though, that you have fora like the UNHRC, where these sort of questions are continually at least talked about and discussed. Because 
one of the main one of the issues here has been that it's typically particular countries get targeted to be democratic while other countries who are also rule breakers but on the right side of friends are given a complete free pass and it happens that way and there's a tendency then for kind of a basic hypocrisy to build into that process ultimately that i think the chinese and chinese themselves know that the greatest one single greatest political risk that they have is what happens to their system and it's just an open question which will never go away and the hope is as Asians that China has risen to sufficient degree of sophistication and economic wealth that they are safe to become democratic without becoming destabilizing. That's the hope. But obviously it's on everybody's mind. The system is not going to be permanent. When is that day when it is not, when that permanence, permanence fades? And I think the Chinese perhaps feel the most. Um, I mean, it's a hugely thorny question, isn't it? And I think anyone looking at Xi Jinping's China over the last couple of years would say they're moving not in the direction of democracy, but rather... Well, there are two, two contradictory elements there, aren't there? One, one is a consolidation of power, but then the other is uh, the extensive attempt to embed the rule of law across a whole range of issues. So there is, there is a big contradiction there in what's going on in China. I don't think we've read that clearly yet. That's true, that's true. But I guess if you look at signals like uh, what's happening to human rights lawyers and, and crackdown on corruption, right, corruption and things like this, it's, it's targeted and it's, you know, Yes, I think you know there is a lot more talk about the rule of law, but in but in particular areas. Talk, no, 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 there is a lot of you're right institutionalisation, yeah. but some really concerning moves as well. But I think in all of this, it's never been public lecturing of China by other countries that has helped in any way to move it towards greater democracy. It's at, at most other countries can have these conversations behind the scenes. Well, it I think this, to, is, this is hit Russia's strategy, right. uh, but this is this ought to be a, a central part of our dialogue with China, but. Uh, the idea that uh, from outside we can basically uh, manage this process, which is a very complex process, I think. I, I mean, I happen to believe that uh, unless China moves to a more representative form of government, it will not achieve what it wants to economically. There's a stage at which it will have to come. Uh, but uh, the idea that uh, that's going to be done from outside easily uh, is... Uh, Dream, well, dream man. One comment, one quick final point. The, I guess the, the one role that foreign countries can play is continuing to open up our borders to tourists because you know Chinese tourists traveling to Japan, to Taiwan, to Australia get to see what other forms of government look like in practice. And I think you know that seems to be the long game of Naing Zhou, for instance, uh, in Taiwan. Now, it's a bit, maybe a very long game, but that seems to be one. Uh, Peter, um, can I just join, jump in one? And uh, I would just want to flag one small element where this can actually get a little dangerous, where the, you see that the Chinese people are not there getting that democratic, but you have, uh, you have secessionist movements in China, and you have you have in these in, 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 in Tibet and Xinjiang, and there might be a temptation that you know what at least maybe if we can foment a little bit of of of, of rebellion out there that we can and these and, and these factors and these and these 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 enablers themselves are of a more democratic bent of mind. Maybe that might rub off in some way, but I think that's actually a very very dangerous argument. And and uh, there's that, that that it could it could feed into that temptation, and that could have more geopolitical tensions and create tensions and worries rather than really have anything to do much with democratization. Uh, time for one more question, and then uh, we probably have to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that engaging uh, talk. I just wanted to ask you, Professor Drysdale, that three or th two or three years ago. Your view was on the TPP was that well, it was not not so not not very positive, and you you favoured or I thought you favoured the the RCEP system. Um, now that the TPP is near completion, has your view um, become a bit more positive on the TPP's current frame? And in particular, me, yes. <laughs> I'm moderating. That. <laughs> Well, the short answer to that question is that uh, what next after TPP? TPP is, is one achievement, 
and particularly important for the US-Japan relationship, not much for the rest of us, but particularly important for the US-Japan relationship. But uh, this is a question, where does Japan go next? It's dealing with the rest of the world, the region, the rest of China. And so, uh, you know, uh, the success, if we can manage it, of RCEP will be really rather critical to that. Uh, and, and managing that, the economics and the politics of that will be, be critical to uh, filling in the hole uh, that Hitoshi mentioned on regional diplomacy. Japan will go to Europe. And, uh, Japan to Europe, free yeah. trade. Yeah. And also ours. But it's actually because Europe is hardly the most dynamic part of the world. Yeah, I know. And if you look, if you look at, if you look at Asia, uh, despite uh, many analysts in the game yeah, saying uh, China's collapsed, the truth of the matter is that even on the latest downgrade of growth in the region, yeah. this is a region that's growing at 6.5, 6.3 percent. I think the whole common, yeah. common objective for us is to make sure. That China will, you know, follow the international system, international rule of law, and all sorts of things. And again, in order for us to be able to do it, we need to have some type of countervailing power. That's TPP. That's our objective of concluding That's the a agreement That's a with uh, with Europe, RCEP as well. We would like to scale up. The world of, you know, rules, even in relation to trade and investment. China will undoubtedly follow. China cannot survive without international system. That's what we would like to aim. So this is the global vision. So this is probably an appropriate point at which to turn to you all together finally and ask you uh, about, uh, you know, what strategies and arrangements, including the uh, global and international arrangements uh, uh, you would want to put in place uh, to manage the relationship between, I mean political, security, economic, uh, to manage the relationship between Japan and its neighbours over the next 10, 20 years or so. Why don't I start with the uh, UN and we'll end up with the <laughs> Toshi. Um, well, I completely agree with uh, Tanaka Sensei's point about the importance of diplomacy, and I think. Um, diplomacy with particular countries that have been a bit undergone in the recent years. We're, we've, we've seen some good steps, but uh, that needs to continue. Um, in terms of what strategies, um, and again, this is embarrassing, a second plug for the East Asia Forum, importantly. Um, <laughs> but one of, our goals, <laughs> I know, one of our goals with this special issue was to get voices from Japan and China, more important than the rest of us in some ways in this, in this exact question, to get them to talk about what's next for the future of that critical relationship. And there are a number of strategies identified there about what's needed internationally, bilaterally, and domestically uh, on both sides to get that particular relationship moving forward. And I think if that relationship can, can move in a, uh, a healthier direction, it will make all the questions for, for Australia, for Southeast Asian countries, and, and the US perhaps easier to manage. Sure. First, sticking just with regard to Japan, um, I would like to see, ideally, if Japan can rebuild the bases of its political relations with China. Um, we have seen prime ministers during this past decade, I'm talking on Mr. Hatoyama and I'm talking on Mr. Fukuda, who came in with a different approach towards China and it automatically changed the nature of that relationship in a very short period of time. This is doable. But it must not only depend on the prime ministers themselves. Um, that whole cadre of not pro-China lawmakers, but China filia uh, of politicians in Japan, to a large degree, I think, has been eviscerated. And over the last 15, 20 years, and I would like—I don't know how—but that cross that it would be useful and necessary to rebuild that cadre uh, simply out of make make virtue out of necessity. China is there, it's, it's rising, it's great, and it just has to be done. And this relationship has to work on that basis. Um, secondly, uh, in terms of, uh, terms of deterrence, uh, be very clear and specific in terms of when you have your rules of engagement with your allies and partners as to what you will do and give a fair sense of what will not be done 
and there is a tendency to talk up of all the problems and what and, and how we are getting together to do things, but there are also areas where there, where <coughs> obligations are not extended, and that can create areas where there is real danger because. If obligations are not going to be executed, you can have the opponent run a freight train right through and make it seem that way. Uh, thirdly, I would like to see East Asian multilateralism flourish. I know there are competing regionalisms, but as much as possible, try to locate as many solutions as possible at the East Asian regional at, uh, at these at these regional fora. And finally, again, just coming back to Japan. Japan doesn't have good relations with Korea, doesn't have good relations with Russia, doesn't have good relations with, with China, and, and of course North Korea is a different different <laughs> order altogether. It's just it's it's you just cannot come out there and say like this because that party is doing this, that party is doing that. This Japan is not in relative ascent, it's more in relative decline. It has to make virtue of necessity and find that these relationships are productive from a diplomatic standpoint, and that has solved a lot of the insecurities and worries and, and, and competition, the power competition. Well, I'm not uh, too worried about the uh, coming tendency. I mean, there is a clear sign of improvement of the relations with China, with Korea. Russia, I don't know, we cannot go beyond a unity among the West, but yet I think you know, eventually, we will have a better relation with Russia. But what is more important in my mind is the question we are dealing with is enormously complex and difficult question. How to cope with China? Big, big rice, but yet we need them. So for that, it's very simple uh, sort of measure will not be suffice. We, I would like to call for what we call multi-layered functionalism. Depending upon specific function, we have different groupings in terms of how security. We will have to rely upon this US Japan and also you know trilaterals between Japan, Australia and the United States and other types of trilaterals as well. We would like to create the confidence building mechanism in the region uh, with small number of nations like right? Japan, China, Korea, and the United States. But at the same time, we would like to increase the common stake with China and other other members of the region. That is to do with the question of trade and investment in the form of ourselves. And also energy and environmental cooperation. Uh, you may uh, be, uh, not uh, be comfortable, but yet I would like to see East Asia Summit to be the forum for so with this uh, concept of multi-layer functions, depending upon functions, we have different combination of nations. That is probably one of the ways to focus in the future China. So I think it's a question of making that, that mechanism work, and it doesn't work at the moment. I think it doesn't work at the moment because of its history and structure. It needs to be related to the mechanisms that do make it work. But uh, this has been uh, serious fun. Uh, <laughs> so join me in thanking the panelists very much.